Our second reading is taken from Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20, and we'll read the first 13 verses of this chapter. Here we have the account of the Israelites in the wilderness of Zin, uh, some 40 years after they uh, begun uh, to wander around in that wilderness and just before uh, they will enter into the land of promise. Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin, in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh. And Miriam died there and was buried. And there was no water for the congregation, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode or strived or contended with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have you made us to come out up out of Egypt to bring us in unto this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, And there they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth its water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord, as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. This is the water of Meribah, because the children of Israel strove with the Lord, and he was sanctified in them. Amen. May the Lord again bless the reading of his word to us. The the text that we uh, want to consider this morning is verses 10 and 11, uh, where Moses and Aaron are at the rock and uh, they they call out uh, to the congregation, speak to them. Moses smites the rock and water comes out abundantly. That's what we want to consider centrally uh, this morning, but we also... Uh, want to take in this whole account uh, and see uh, what the Lord is doing here uh, in this in this whole account from verse one through to thirteen. The Israelites in the wilderness uh, exemplify uh, the church in the gospel age. The Israelites in the wilderness exemplify or Uh, pictures of or examples of the church in the gospel age, that is, in our age in which we live. As saints in the gospel age, like the fathers in the wilderness, we have been delivered out of Egypt from the bondage of sin. We have been baptised through the Red Sea. We are wandering now even Uh, through a dry and a barren wilderness. We are led by Christ, the pillar of cloud by uh, day and fire by night. 
we meet with God uh, in the tabernacle, that is in the person of the God-man, Jesus Christ. We receive our sustenance from Jesus Christ, the spiritual manna from heaven, and we receive the water of life and satisfaction from Christ, uh, who is the spiritual rock. We can learn so much uh, from the Israelites in the wilderness uh, because they exemplify us, the church in the gospel age. What is true of them uh, is true of us. What God was to them, God is to us today. That's the principle that we operate on as we consider uh, this text today. And our focus today is to draw uh, spiritual lessons uh, from uh, this account of rebels at the rock. This text speaks of the Israelites. They are revealed to be a needy people, particularly in desperate need of water. They are a thirsty people. They are revealed in this passage to be also a rebellious people, a turning against God, his providence, and his everlasting mercy. This points to us. We are a needy people. We are needy for spiritual drink. And sadly, we are also a rebellious lot. God's dealings with the Israelites in our passage teaches us much about us. Needy of spiritual drink, a rebellious lot. But God's dealings with the Israelites in this passage teaches us so much about himself. So much about his glory. So much about his gospel uh, for sinners in desperate need. So let's take up consideration of this text then this morning and humbly seek uh, to learn from it something of ourselves and something of our almighty and gracious God. So rebels at the rock. This is an account of uh, rebels, rebel sinners at the rock. First, we want to gather in this whole event, this historical event, and have that uh, firmly before our minds. And then we want to focus in on verse 10 and 11 more specifically and see what we learned there about ourselves. And then we want to conclude uh, by seeing what we can learn about our God from those verses. <clears throat> so what do we learn of this historical event? Well, the Israelites, as I've said, were a needy and a rebellious people. <clears throat> they were in desperate need. They were, at this moment, in Kadesh, in the desert of Zin. That's just south of the land of Canaan. And it was an altogether lifeless and inhospitable place. We read that in verses uh, uh, 2 and, and 4 and 5 particularly. There was no water for the congregation here. And then in verse 4, when they're crying out to Moses, Why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, a barren wasteland, uh, simply to die? So barren was it that there was no sustenance uh, for any of the people or the animals. And then they go on complaining, made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place. It, has, it is no place of seed or figs or vines or pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. They were in Kadesh, uh, a desert, a wilderness, a barren wasteland. No food and absolutely no water. And they were a thirsty uh, people. Think of that two million 
plus people in the middle of a desert uh, that is a barren wasteland. It's not something that we know much of today, what it is to be truly thirsty and uh, have no hope or expectation of having anything to drink in the, in the near future. We have water in abundance. I never remember a time in my life uh, where I have gone without water for more than a few hours at a time. Here the Israelites were in a barren wilderness without water to drink and they were thirsty and they looked around themselves and they saw no water to drink. They were in a desperate need. God had led them into a place uh, of, of lifelessness, no water. They were a thirsty people. So they did what Israelites do best. They murmured and they rebelled against God and particularly against this afflicting providence that he had brought upon them. The congregation, we read, gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. That's verse 2. And the people chode or strived, contended, complained against Moses. This was an angry mob, a thirsty, angry, rebellious mob. These two million plus Israelites rose up in anger and rebellion against Moses and against Aaron, charging them with unfair accusations. We need to notice there, why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord? They, they acknowledge themselves to be God's people when they look at Moses and Aaron and they say, why have you brought us up into this place simply uh, to cause us to die? So who was this rebellion really against? This rebellion wasn't against Moses or Aaron, although that's where the people directed uh, this rebellion. Who led the people into this wilderness? God led the people into the wilderness. Surely it was that cloud of, of, of glory by day and the pillar of, fly, of fire by night that led the children into the wilderness. That is, God himself led them. Their rebellion was not against men. Their rebellion was against God himself. So we see that in verse 10, Moses speaks according to the truth uh, when he addresses the people as rebels. Hear now, ye rebels. These people were rebels. They rebelled against God and against his providence uh, to bring them into this place uh, that was without water. God had caused them uh, to be thirsty by his uh, afflicting providence and they rebelled against God. So the people were thirsty, in desperate need for water and they were rebellious. But we need to see as well that Moses and Aaron were rebellious uh, leaders also. Moses and Aaron fled from that angry mob into the tabernacle and fell down on their faces in desperate, uh, in fear perhaps, uh, fleeing from the angry mob and coming to God, laying down on their faces before him, desperate for a word from God, for a deliverance from God. And then we see that the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. We would remember from Exodus 33 uh, what that glory of the Lord is. Earlier, uh, when Moses was on Mount Sinai, he asked uh, to see the glory of God. Lord, show me thy glory. And how did God respond? I will make all of my goodness to pass before thee. I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. That is the glory of the Lord. It's his grace and it's his mercy uh, to pitiful and undeserving sinners. It is his long-suffering 
his slowness to anger and wrath uh, with obstinate rebel sinners. This is God's glory and this uh, was revealed and, and much, much more of God. But this in particular was revealed uh, to Aaron and to Moses uh, in that tabernacle. So they fell down on their face before God as the angry, thirsty, rebellious mob was outside um, seeking probably to destroy them. And they come before God and what does God do? He shows them his glory. The God of grace, the God of mercy, the God who is long-suffering, slow to anger uh, with an obstinate and rebellious people. And the thing that we need to understand is this is exactly what God intended to show uh, the Israelites, these rebellious Israelites. God goes on to give a clear command to Moses to carry out uh, this desire. Take uh, thy rod and gather thou the assembly together. Gather them around uh, the rock and speak to the rock before their eyes. And God gives a clear promise, a beautiful promise, a promise that is full of grace and mercy and long-suffering. And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts to drink. God promises to pour out water from uh, the rock in order that these thirsty, uh, angry rebels might drink and be satisfied. He promises to show himself to be the God of grace and mercy to pity, pitiful and undeserving wretches. He promises to show unimaginable long-suffering and goodness uh, to these people. But what do Moses and Aaron do in the face of this? They disobey. They show themselves uh, to be as rebellious as the people. Yes, Moses, Moses obediently gathers the people to the rock with his rod in his hand, but that's as far as his obedience goes. Moses speaks, but not to the rock. Here now, ye rebels, must we fetch water out of this rock for you? Verse 10. As we said, Moses certainly speaks according to truth here. The congregation gathered around the rock were a mob of angry, contentious rebels. But he was directed by God to speak to the rock, not to the people. Then Moses goes on in his rebellion and he smites the rock twice. And Moses lifted up his hand and with his rod he smote the rock twice. Moses was directed to speak to the rock. He spoke in anger to the congregation. Moses was directed to speak to the rock, but he smote the rock, he struck the rock. God's assessment of this disobedience was that it was the sin of unbelief and the sin of smothering God's glory. God was determined to have himself sanctified in the eyes of the Israelites. This means that his desire was to be set apart in their hearts as the glorious one, as the God of mercy, as the God of grace, as the God of all long-suffering, as the God of infinite goodness. He determined to do this by providing water uh, from the rock as pure grace and mercy to rebellious sinners. Moses and Aaron did not believe God. They, they, did, not, they did believe that God could do this. They'd seen uh, this very same power of God go out some 40 years uh, earlier in the first instance of water coming from the rock. But they did not believe that God should manifest this glory to these people and in this way, how could God do uh, such a thing for uh, obstinate, angry, sinful rebels? These surely were sinners, undeserving of such a manifestation of God's glory. That's Moses' thinking. 
And second, they did not believe that God was wise in his method of revealing his glory. Moses and Aaron had what they saw as a better way. They deemed it more appropriate uh, to show anger and wrath. Yes, provoked anger and wrath, but anger and wrath rather than subdue that and show mercy and grace. So Moses and Aaron showed themselves uh, to be rebels, just like the rest of the people. They were guilty of disobedience. They were guilty of anger. They were guilty of hypocrisy. Uh, Moses here charging the people uh, with with rebellion when the very act of charging them with rebellion at this point in time demonstrated his own rebellion. He was a hypocrite. He was an angry hypocrite. And they were disobedient. They did not believe God and they did not sanctify God uh, the, they endeavoured to, to with, withhold God's glory from the people. So they were disobedient, angry, hypocritic rebels. And God chastises them severely for this sin, as we read. He, de- he uh, withholds from them the great privilege of leading uh, the Israelites into the land of Canaan. So we have here the Israelites, they are a needy people in desperate need of water. They are thirsty. They are rebellious, all of them. The people are those who God uh, ordained to be their leaders, all rebels. We also see in this event that God shows uh, his goodness. God shows his goodness. He promised uh, water for these people. God promised that he would show himself to be the God of glory, the God of mercy, the God of grace, the God of all long-suffering. God, in a manifestation of his faithfulness uh, to his words, supplies what he promised. Water pours from the rock. Despite the obstinate rebellion of the people, despite the obstinate rebellion of of Moses and Aaron. God manifests himself as the good God, the God who is faithful to supply uh, what the people stand in need of, what he has promised. God shows himself to be the good and faithful God. And by this, God is sanctified. He is sanctified in the eyes of the people. He is manifest to be that God of grace and mercy to undeserving and pitiful sinners. He is manifest to be the God of incomprehensible long-suffering to obstinate rebels. He is manifest to be uh, the God of glorious goodness and faithfulness. God is sanctified in the eyes of uh, the rebels at the rock. That is the historical event that we see here uh, in this passage. What do we learn about ourselves? Applying the principle that the church in the wilderness, the Israelites in the wilderness, exemplify us. What do we learn about ourselves from this? We as saints in the gospel age uh, have a spiritual thirst. God has led us into the wilderness. We dwell as pilgrims in the wilderness of this world. In this world there is no uh, spiritual water uh, whatsoever around about us. We stand in need, in desperate need, of spiritual drink. And God is the one who has led us here, has ordained it to be so. We need to be very careful not to make the same mistake as these rebels in the wilderness. It was Christ, the pillar of fire and cloud, that led them. And it is the same Christ who leads us today. 
We stand in need of spiritual drink, just like our fathers before us. We live uh, in a world of spiritual uh, dearth, a spiritual wasteland. We are spiritually thirsty. That is what we sung in Psalm 42. Like as a heart for water brooks, in thirst doth pant and bray. So pants my longing soul, O God, that come to thee I may. My soul for God, the living God, doth thirst. This is the confession and the experience of every true saint. Like a deer in the dry bush in the highlands, it longs after uh, that cool stream that flows uh, down the mountain to drink from it. It pants after it. It longs for it. So our soul thirsts after and longs after the water, the spiritual water that flows uh, from the living God. What is this spiritual thirst uh, that the saints have, that we have? This spiritual thirst is a lack of a spiritual life and happiness. A thirsty soul is a soul uh, that is, is dying because it's deprived of uh, the, the very thing that is needed to sustain life, water. It's a soul that is lacking in true happiness and delight. A soul that is lacking in true Satisfaction, spiritual satisfaction. A thirsty soul has an urgent desire after everlasting life and fuller and fuller manifestations and experiences of everlasting life. It has an urgent desire after spiritual happiness and delight. It has an urgent desire to be spiritually satisfied, truly satisfied. Is it true of us that we are spiritually thirsty people? I've heard often of the saints, even in this place, cry out uh, with thirst for the living water that they know and perceive can alone quench their thirst. That is a glorious thing. That is a wonderful and beautiful thing because it is the desire of a converted soul. We should be very concerned if this thirst does not mark us, this longing, this panting uh, after the living water uh, that is in God alone. Are we thirsty for this spiritual water? Do we desire to come uh, to the rock in the wilderness ready and eager to drink up, uh, to engorge ourselves in the refreshing, sustaining, reviving water that flows from that rock. The only thing more terrible than being uh, spiritually thirsty and finding no water uh, is to have a complete lack of this spiritual thirst. That is a soul that is unaware of its need or that is a soul that is perhaps finding or attempting to find its satisfaction in the things of the world where there can be no true spiritual life or satisfaction found that's lasting. Would to God that we would be those uh, who thirst as these Israelites did and be provided for as these Israelites have been provided for. As the saints in the gospel age, we thirst after spiritual water. That is the first thing that we learn about ourselves from this passage. The second thing is that we are also spiritual rebels. As saints in this gospel age, as our fathers were before us, uh, we rebel in so many different ways. The words of Moses ring true down through the ages. Hear now, ye rebels. 
This should uh, hit us like a hammer. Yes, these were ill-advised words of Moses, spoken uh, in provoked anger, but they remain true words, true then, true for us. We rebel against God in so many ways. Every time we willingly sin, we rebel against God. Every time we even grumble or contend with the afflicting providences of God, as the Israelites did here, we rebel. Who here would dispute it? Who here would dispute uh, that we are all a bunch of obstinate rebels? I personally don't dispute it at all. So we learn from this text that we as gospel age saints, we are obstinate, undeserving rebel sinners just like our fathers before us. We are nothing but thirsty rebels at the rock. What was true of God all those years ago uh, is true of God today. Who God was then, what God did then, is, is who God is now and what God is doing now. We learn much about our God uh, from this passage. Spiritual drink comes from God. That is the first uh, thing we want to remember. Spiritual drink comes from God. God the Father has provided uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as the rock from whom flows uh, rivers of living water. The Apostle Paul makes this uh, explicitly clear in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4. Speaking of those fathers in the wilderness, all did drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock is Christ. The Father, in mercy and grace to rebellious and thirsty sinners, has given uh, to us his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the rock. God has given him to be the source of spiritual life uh, in this world for his people. That is the wonderful gift of God to us. This water that comes from Christ as the rock is spiritual life itself. That's what we read in John chapter 4. Verse 14, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Christ is the rock. The water that flows from him is everlasting life itself. This water brings life to dry and parched souls. This water brings true spiritual happiness and delight uh, to the soul. This uh, spiritual life brings true and abiding satisfaction. The soul that drinks from this water is truly satisfied. And it comes only from Christ. He is the alone rock in the wilderness from whom rivers of living water flows. It doesn't come from the carnal delights of this world. There is no spiritual uh, blessing, spiritual life uh, from the things of this world. There is no true happiness. There's no true delight in those things. There's no true abiding soul satisfaction from the things of this world. And when will we we get this point? 
Uh, we fill up our time seeking happiness, seeking life, seeking satisfaction. But we so often misdirect it. So often we seek those things everywhere but where it can be found. In all of the foibles of this world that aren't sin necessarily in themselves but that we're trying to fill up our soul with life and satisfaction and happiness and delight with. When will we get it? That the rivers of living water, that, that true life, everlasting life, that true delight and happiness of the soul, that true satisfaction comes uh, from Jesus Christ, the rock, and flows from him uh, like rivers of everlasting life. It comes from Christ alone. We learn from this passage that God is the good God who has provided the rock, Jesus Christ, and from him are flows rivers of living water. The second thing we want to note uh, that we can learn about our God is that he supplies and provides uh, this water even uh, for obstinate rebels. God has promised to provide spiritual drink. God provides spiritual drink. That's his promise. It shall give forth his water. God has given the Lord Jesus Christ as the rock, and it shall give forth his water. From Christ will flow rivers of everlasting life. We should see God's faithfulness here to provide what he has promised. The water came out abundantly. God is pouring out abundant rivers of living water from a Jesus Christ. Everywhere there is a faithful preacher gathering thirsty rebels are to the rock. There the rivers of living water are being poured out. Everywhere the means of grace are being used, whether in public or in private, are there the rivers of living water are being poured out. Everywhere the saints earnestly and with due preparation attend upon these means of grace, uh, the rivers of living water are flowing liberally uh, from Jesus Christ through the means of grace. God provides what he promised. God provides spiritual drink in this way, even for needy uh, rebel sinners. The gospel is none other than God's goodness uh, to rebel sinners. This is what Moses fundamentally failed to understand. And this is what I want you to understand if it's the only thing that you take home today. Compare God's gospel with Moses' anti-gospel. God's gospel is to show goodness and long-suffering to rebel sinners. Moses' gospel is that this should not and could not be. Must we fetch you, you obstinate rebels, water from this rock? God's gospel is to manifest mercy in abundance to sinners as sinners. Moses' gospel was that there was to be no mercy for these rebels. God's gospel is to invite sinners as sinners to come and to drink the rivers of living water that flow from Jesus Christ. Moses' gospel was to bar the way to sinners so that they may not come to Christ and drink his water. God's gospel declares that your sins are exactly what qualifies you uh, to receive mercy from God. Moses' gospel declared that your sins rule you out, disqualify you uh, from receiving this mercy. The gospel of God in our text is that uh, not that you should somehow prepare yourself for grace and mercy 
in order to come to Christ to drink his living water, but rather it is let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will let him take from the water of life freely. That's Revelation 22, verse 17, the parting words of our Lord and Saviour. The gospel of God is come to the waters that flow from Jesus Christ and drink freely. Don't come with a pseudo life of repentance and holiness in your hands as though to offer that up to God as payment for the water. Come the only way that you can come with the only thing that you can offer to God and that is your sinful rebellion. That is the gospel of God that is revealed in our text. Hear ye now, ye rebels. This is water flowing abundantly from Jesus Christ. Come, gather around him and drink and be satisfied. Drink to restore your life. Drink to restore true happiness. Drink to be eternally satisfied. And this is the gospel that we need to have impressed upon our hearts and minds this morning. God has provided Jesus Christ the rock to needy and rebellious sinners and he bids us to come as needy sinners to this rock, gather around him and drink in the rivers of living water that flow from him. We need to be careful and aware as well that this is no antinomian gospel or uh, no law gospel. It is only drinking from the spiritual life that is flowing from Jesus Christ that any uh, sinner will have a true heart of gospel, evangelical repentance. Uh, Before Christ and the life that is flowing from him is ours, all that looks like repentance is nothing but uh, legalism, nothing but a slavish uh, fear of the consequences of our sin. Coming to the rock and drinking richly from the grace and mercy of God in the life that flows from Jesus Christ is the only way uh, to come to true uh, repentance for your sins. That is why in Romans four, uh, 2 verse 4, uh, it is exclaimed, the goodness, know you not that the goodness of God uh, leads you to repentance. We have to apprehend the goodness of God in the person of Jesus Christ and drink from the rivers of life that flow from him in order to do what is required of us and repent of our sins. We learn also and finally that God is sanctified in the eyes of his saints, even in this gospel age. In providing Christ and the spiritual water that is flowing from him, our God is sanctified in the eyes of men. He is manifest to be glorious in the eyes of men. He's set apart in their hearts and their minds as the God of glory the God of mercy to those who are pitiful wretches, the God of grace to those who are undeserving sinners, the God of long-suffering, slow to anger and wrath uh, to those who are obstinate rebels. He is the God of glory to thirsty, uh, rebellious sinners gathered around the rock. This is truly good news. God is sanctified. He's set apart in the hearts of his people as the one uh, who is glorious in all that he is doing for the redemption of his people in Jesus Christ, the rock. Despite our obstinate rebellion, despite uh, the people's rebellion, the leader's rebellion, God is showing forth his glory. Let's conclude with this uh, thought. We know well from our shorter catechism that man's chief end is to glorify and enjoy God. I would put it to you that this is achieved uh, most 
especially, most eminently, by doing exactly what uh, is before us here in this passage. God was sanctified, set apart as glorious in the eyes of the people uh, when they came and drank from the water flowing from the rock. God is glorified when we come uh, to the rock and drink from all of the riches uh, and grace of the glory of God in that, the everlasting life flowing from Jesus. And in that, uh, we have our enjoyment in God. That is how we both glorify and enjoy God. We have that, that full bursting heart that is satisfied and, and happy uh, as we are drinking from the water that flows from the rock. So we are to glorify and enjoy God. And this is how we do it. By gathering together around the rock, Jesus Christ, and drinking in deeply uh, from the rivers of living water uh, that flow out of him. Amen. <clears throat> Let's stand.